Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to finish the book that we started last week about honeybees. And then we are going to read Perkins Perfect Purple. I actually just got this. I've been waiting for this from the public library because I ordered a copy and it hasn't come yet. And then I ordered one from the public library. So I just got to read this <laughs> and it's really good. And I'm really excited to read it to you. Uh, there's Max. Yeah, Josh, you had a question or comment. I see your hand is up. No? Josh? Okay, we're gonna move on. If you have a question later, um, then let me know. Okay, so, okay, we are, I'm gonna share my screen in just a sec and we will go back to the honeybee. Here we go. Okay, so anyone um, want to give us a little, I mean, it's not like a story necessarily where we want a, a summary of the plot, but things that we know now about honeybees um, that you didn't know before we started reading this book. What, uh, do you guys remember, what are we waiting for this poor little bee to be able to do? Elizabeth. To fly. Oh yes, sorry Elizabeth. Uh, yes, to fly, she will get there. Um, I think actually with our class, were we one, one step ahead of this page or was this where we left off? I'm pretty sure we were ahead of this page. Hang on one second, one second. There we go, okay. Um, I think we were one, one page ahead. I think this is where Mrs. Harris cl this class. Uh, we did queen tending. I think this is where we left off. Okay, so make that even bigger. You guys can see, all right? Okay, so we are going to go back to this little uh, worker bee who had just hatched a few days ago and she's already gone through several different jobs. Um, and now we are going to see what she does again or her, her job will change again. Okay, so was she going to fly yet? Not yet. Comb building, using her wax, her sharp spoon-shaped jaws, her legs, she shapes, she molds, maneuvers cre to create cells. So what's going to go into these wax cells? Anyone? Lindsay, did you? Honey. Honey? So some could be for honey, but also do you remember what happened at the very beginning of this story or this book that we read? Yeah, Josh. The larvae or yeah. the eggs. So these, these um, I believe these are actually for, um, for the eggs to be laid in. These are like their little um, kind of cradles for, for the eggs to hatch in, uh, into larva. But Apis is not a builder for long. Three days later, she starts flying. Is she gonna fly yet? Not yet, not yet. Food handling, Apis stands on soft honeycomb waiting. A forager bee approaches, dusted with pollen and smelling of sunshine and fresh air. She is loaded with nectar. So as we will see, this forager bee, this is one of her jobs coming up. She's gonna be doing that too, the, um, our little Apis, but she's not quite there yet. Food for the colony, Apis creeps, creeps towards her. Furry heads bump and the forager brings up the nectar into her mouth. Sticking her straw-like tongue, Apis sips up the nectar. She folds and unfolds, folds and unfolds, folds and unfolds her mouth until the nectar grows st thicker, stickier. She stores the half-dried nectar in an empty cell. Over the next few days, it will ripen into honey. So some of those cells were for honey, like Lindsay said. When Apis turns 18 days old, she is ready to start her life outside. Now is she ready to fly? Maybe? Oh, not yet. Okay, she has one job, one job outside before she can fly. Guarding against birds or bears or bees from other nests. 
Patrolling a tiny patch of the hive's entrance, Apis sniffs each incoming worker with her antenna. Friend or foe, two bees hover nearby. Apis bends her antenna towards them and tests the air. They do not smell like members of her colony. She stands on her hind legs. They do not act like members of her colony. Apis lets off an alarm scent to warn the others, robber bees. They've come to steal the honey from the nest. Apis flings herself at one of them. The two grab hold of each other's legs. They curl their abdomens. They roll and grapple. Apis buzzes, bites, and burrows. She is willing to give up her life to protect her nest and its honey. She bites harder. Shaking her off, the robber flies away. At last, on the 25th day of her life, the sun just rising and the dew still drying, she leaps from the nest and here it is flies it feels like the book should maybe be over at this point because we've been building it up building up to this right but no thousands of other bees rise from the nest too first to orient themselves and then to forage for water or collect a sticky plant sap called propolis a kind of bee glue or gather pollen and apis she is in search of sweet nectar her antenna tastes the breeze milkweed, coneflower, clover. She can smell the sugary goodness inside their blossoms. So when beekeepers um, are keeping bees for, you know, to, to make honey, they can sometimes, they can know what flowers the bees have gone to, what flowers are nearby and what flowers are kind of giving the bees access to. So you can, sometimes if you buy honey from a market, it will say like, lavender honey, or it'll say blackberry honey, or it'll say, um, you know, some kind of wildflower honey, and it'll taste different based on the types of flowers that the bee has been visiting. Apis follows the floral odor for miles. Wings beat 200 times a second until she circles down. She alights on a blossom, she scrambles over petals, searches for the nectar inside. Poking her long tongue deep inside the flower, she sips and swallows and skips to the next flower. The sugary liquid does not go into her belly. It goes into a special sac called a honey stomach. So it's not actually a stomach. So when the, she met the other bee, remember what happened? Um, the other forager bee that gave her back the nectar that it had collected? It was almost like it was throwing it up and giving it to her, but it's not coming from its stomach. It's like a little pouch in its body that's just for collecting the nectar that it's gonna give to another bee to make the honey. Makes it maybe slightly less gross than, than throwing it up. She visits each flower. Grains of pollen stick to her, her brushy body. They cling to her bristly legs. She carries this pollen from flower to flower, brushing it off, picking it up, pollinating the field. At last, her honey stomach weighs almost as much as she does. Then wings working hard, she flies back to the hive where she gives up her nectar to a food handler, like she used to be. Now will she rest? No, she will dance. Wagging her tail, Apis circles to the left, then to the right. She runs in a long straight line. Other bees gather around. They listen to the vibrations of her dance. Apis is giving directions. She's telling them that the nectar is sweet. She is asking them to go there too. Soon a stream of bees head for her find. Apis makes nine more trips that day, gathering, pollinating before the sun finally sets and she can rest. But she will be back tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. She grows thinner and slower. She loses her hair, her wings fray and tatter. Summertime bees do not live long. Apis is now, oh, she's so old. She's such an old lady, 35 days old. She has flown back and forth between the nest and blossoms, 500 miles in all. She's visited 30,000 flowers, has connect connected enough nectar to make 1 12th of a teaspoon of honey. Her work is done. On the morning, Apis drops to the ground. The air is warm. The sun is rising and the nectar is sweet. She rolls to her back. Her legs move limply. Her wings beat weakly and above her, 
Blossoms nod in the, in the summer breeze. Apis stills. And back in the nest, a brand new honeybee squirms, pushes, chews through the wax cap of her solitary cell a, into a teeming, trembling flurry. Hum. And we are back where we started. And so with all of these cool nonfiction books, they always have lots of extra stuff at the back. So here we have this cool diagram of a bee um, with all the different parts of its body and what they do to um, help it take care of its hive and collect nectar and collect pollen and all the things that bees do. Um, and a whole bunch of other info about bees. So we will have this book in the library if next year you wanna take a look at it. I think what I'm gonna to try to do is um, have these books kind of rotate in the fifth grade classrooms a little bit after we're all done with this. So you guys can have some time to look at them close up. Okay, we are going to read Perkins, Perfect Purple. And what I, I'm reading this not, um, not on Sora. So I will actually be showing you all the pictures in this. So I wanna ask a question before we start reading this book. This book is about the creation of a color, which is a crazy thing to think that you would have to like figure out a way to make it. How do you think when you buy a shirt or a toy or a blanket for your bed or something like that, in a certain color, how do you think it gets to be that color? I just kind of like, you know, what do we know about this? Elizabeth. By mixing other colors. By mixing other colors, but what kinds of things do we use to, like, if you're going to, you're wearing a purple shirt right now, what, what kinds of stuff do you think would be mixed together to make that shirt purple. I wasn't so sure about this. I knew, I kind of knew, I had a little bit of idea in my, the back of my head that like at least a long time ago, colors and dyes were made from things like plants or um, even insects um, that I know like there's a, a, there's a dye called I can't remember what number it is, red dye number something that's made from a kind of bug. But I hadn't really thought about things that like colors that don't occur so um, commonly in nature. So this is about sort of an accidental chemistry experiment. Somebody who was trying to do something else and ended up discovering something that was cool and useful in another way. So let us read Perkins Perfect Purple. I like saying that too, Perkins Perfect Purple. In 1838, Queen Victoria of England commanded, make me a coronation crown of purple velvet, silver and gold and diamonds and rubies and pearls. Now why purple? Anyone know why purple for a crown? Because purple is the co royal color. Purple is historically the color of royalty. Anyone know why purple was the color for royalty? No idea. And it turns out it is totally related to everything going on in this book. It is because it was a hard color to make. And it was really, really expensive to make anything purple. So the only people who, who could afford to have purple were kings and queens and emperors and the royal. And there are actually laws in England um, before, I think around, before around 1600, it was actually against the law for anybody who is not royalty to wear the color purple. So Queen Victoria wanted a purple crown. The purest metals insisted her goldsmith. The largest diamonds, the reddest rubies said her jeweler. The fattest oysters with the most humongous pearls, her diver declared. Purple's tricky, sulked her cloth maker. Long ago, making purple was complicated. Hundreds of years before, in the ancient town of Tyre, Phoenicians had harvested a certain snail, a marine mollusk named Bolinus Branderis. 
They milked thousands to release a foul smelling liquid. They cooked it with seawater and potash and waited until it reeked. But the secret recipe for Tyrian purple was lost and so was this gorgeous shade. So in order to make this rare purple, they had to make this super, super stinky stuff made out of snails. So where could Queen Victoria's cap maker find a perfectly purple velvet for her coronation crown? Dyers use lichens and leaves and lumps of wood, bugs and berries, rocks and roots, searching for a substitute for Tyrian purple. But that color could fade unless they soaked the cloth in lime and urine to make the purple stay. Yep, they had to pee on it to make the color stay. And the cloth would, how, how do you, would you want to wear something that had to then been, had to be soaked in pee? No. The cloth would stink and it would be really- Never. Not worth it for like your favorite color, right? The cloth would stink and it wouldn't really be the same as that ancient shade. Yes, purple was tricky. Until finally, years later, a boy named William Henry Perkin invented a new way to make purple without snails, without bugs or berries, and without urine. And what does he have in his hand? What kind of stuff? Can you tell? Where might you see the kind of things he has in his hand? In a, in a lab. In a lab, exactly. He's got chemistry supplies. He's got test tubes and beakers and all sorts of things that you would use as a chemist. This is how it happened. William's father was a successful carpenter, his brother a proud architect. Young William dreamed of being an artist, a musician, a photographer, or a botanist. Everything interested William. You know what a botanist is? What they study? plants. Everything interested William. When he was 12, a friend showed him experiments with crystals. And this he knew was far more exciting than any other subject. He began to collect glassware and equipment and set up a lab in his house in Shadwell in East London. He mixed and measured, experimented and examined. By age 13, he was studying at the City of London School in, near Cheapside. Instead of eating lunch, he listened to lectures on crystals and calculations, matters and math, because William wanted to be a chemist, to explore the elements that make up our world and discover new formulas to make the world better. But his father said, no, chemistry is nothing but trickery. It is not a proud profession. Be an architect like your brother. So this was still at a time where science the way that we think of it was still relatively new, where like the things that you could not easily see how they worked and why they worked were kind of considered like, you know, no, the kind of general population didn't really trust them. So building a house, you know, that's an honest profession, but like mixing potions, I don't know about that. Be an architect like your brother. William begged, his teachers pleaded, and his father finally gave in. He paid for William to attend the, the new Royal College of Chemistry, a school supported by Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria herself. In 1853, our hospitals were overflowed with the sick and thousands died of malaria. Quinine, or uh, I think it's pronounced Quinine, actually. Quinine was the only known antidote. And this is still, if you travel to places in the world that still have a lot of malaria, places where there are a lot of mosquitoes that carry malaria, the way that you keep yourself from getting sick with malaria is to take quinine tablets or drink, um, there's like a soda that you can get that has this um, like medicine in it and it keeps you from getting sick with malaria. It was distilled from the bark of a small Peruvian tree. Only the rich could afford this cure. August Wilhelm von, von Hoffmann, William's teacher at the Royal College, was an expert on coal tar, the messy leftover when coal was used for fuel. Hoffmann speculated that the natural building blocks of quinine were similar to the building blocks of coal tar, and they had tons of coal tar. 
Hoffman wondered, what if the tar was used to synthesize quinine? So like when you synthesize something, it's you're, you're making it in a lab. So you're making it by mixing chemicals together. And he offered William a step-by-step -step formula for this experiment. William was eager for this challenge. Could he cure the rich and poor alike with chemistry? 20 parts carbon, two parts nitrogen, 24 parts hydrogen and two parts oxygen. Could he make quinine from coal tar as Hoffman imagined? Hoffman warned it might not work for this is chemistry. During his spring break in 1856 in the tiny lab on the top floor of his house, William tried anyway. So spring break's coming up. Are you guys going to uh, cure any diseases <laughs> on your spring break? Yeah. Well, there is an opening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mix coal tar with a reacting liquid, a coal orange red substance. Wait for hours upon hours. Yield a useless red sludge. That's what happens sometimes when you're experimenting. It doesn't always work. Noting every step in his lab notebook, William kept trying. This time he tried coal tar, a, a coal tar extract, a compound called aniline. Mix aniline, a salt of sulfuric acid with a red orange reacting liquid. Wait for hours upon hours. Yield useless black sludge. Alone in his lab, William continued to experiment. Filter the mixture, wash with water until, the, uh, until free of the salts and dry at a hot 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Separate the mixture using liquid coal tar and repeat until the mixture was purified. But the experiment was a failure. Quinine could not be made from coal tar. Slowly and sadly, William prepared to clean his beakers. Worried, uh, he worried and wondered about that dark sludge. His scientific training nagged and nudged. Perhaps he should go a step further. Maybe a drop of pure alcohol to separate and evaporate the coal tar liquid, separate the mixture with alcohol and purify it at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That was the moment William discovered that the black goo at the bottom was not just any black goo, but what was it? Examining it further, he dipped a cloth into the solution and the rag turned bright, bold, rich and royal, purple. The tint of wealth, the color of queens, the pigment reserved for bishops and popes and kings. Perkins' vivid purple was concocted from a common sludge, not from the milk of rare snails. It wasn't the cure for malaria, but could a color help people? What good could his invention actually do? William wasn't sure, but he knew somehow that his invention was important. He could produce this purple time and time again by following his detailed lab notes. It didn't require milking a thousand rare, rare snails and Perkins purple didn't stink. Best of all, William's purple would be for all people, not just for the nobility. It was perfect. So yeah, cool, he made a color. I wonder how what he has done can help people other than just like giving them a cool new color to wear. So first to the market in Piccadilly, he ran to purchase white silk to dye samples next to the patent office to secure his invention, then to find 400 pounds of coal, a thousand gallons of water just to get one ounce. But what an ounce, 500 drops of pure perfect Perkins purple. And still where Perkins saw purple, others saw problems. Dyers complained that the color might wash away or fade when it was exposed to light. Professor Hoff Hoffman grumbled, purple is frivolous, fashion isn't science. But William knew one day acres of fabric would be dipped in his dye. And William's father knew, and he sold everything to invest in his son's endeavor. And William's brother knew as well. He abandoned his, his architecture career to help. They bought land to build a factory. They pooled their money and their time and their labor. And they called their company Perkins and Sons. 
They tested Perkins purple on different materials, cotton, calico, wool, and paper. And William developed new ways to keep the color stable on cloth. Light fast, wash fast, permanently purple. Finally, William's invention was ready to unveil. Oh la la, Perkins purple matches my eyes, Empress Eugenie of France cooed. Queen Victoria declared, even better than my crown. Now I must have a purple gown. So Perkins and Sons did just that. Meters of silk and yards of velvet, a bouquet of gowns for Eugenie, as purple as fresh plucked petals, a velvet dress for Queen Victoria, more purple than the setting sun. Soon, London demanded it. Perkins purple, please. Parents couldn't, par not parents, Paris couldn't get enough mauve. Mauve is like a pinkish purple. New York screamed for the queen's lilac. From Europe to Asia, Africa to America, everyone was adorned in purple made by Perkin. 100% snail free. William's purple wasn't reserved for the rich and royal. Purple for the people, purple books and purple pencils, purple socks and purple hats, purple gloves and purple boots. Even Britain's postage stamps, penny lilacs, were printed with William's purple ink and Queen Victoria's, uh, with Queen Victoria's proud profile. And there's actually a picture right here at the back of the book. These are still printed. I think they're in different, for different amounts now, but these are like very kind of famous stamps that were first made with the purple dye. And William Perkin didn't stop there. His idea meant more than just one color. William's discoveries uncovered 2000 more shades, a whole rainbow of colors. His achievements led others to invent an, uh, in new ways, starting with proposals and a hypothesis and observing changes in each step and recording the results. So this is where Perkin's work really did help people. When you do a science experiment, you go through steps, right? You have to know what you're looking for. You have to have your plan of how you're going to approach it. And when you finish it, you write a conclusion and you document your results. Does anyone know what this is called when you do that? Scientific process. Yeah, scientific, it's called, specific it's called scientific method. And this was a, an even more specific way of using the scientific method with chemistry so that you could know, you could do variations on the same type of experiment and really be able to track your results. And this is like the model for how they test medicine now um, and how they know how to figure out the right doses for different, like right now they're doing a lot of um, testing for the COVID vaccine um, to figure out if it's safe for kids. And they have to figure out that one of the most important things with that is they have to figure out what dosage, how much compared to adults would be the right amount to be safe and to create that kind of immunity. And so this kind of process is exactly what scientists are still using. So this is how he's helping people. William's invention did save lives. It helped create advances in medicine for immune disorders and chemotherapy and cures for tuberculosis and cholera. Perkins Perfect Purple set off a chemical reaction, a scientific rev revolution, brighter, bolder, healthier, happier tomorrow, and all thanks to a colorful chemist, William Henry Perkin. And so just like all of these other books, we've got all this cool, um, information and documentation in the pack, in the back of the book. So we have um, some of the history here that was in the story, but about the way that the, these dyes work before, what is color and why is it such a big deal? Um, a little more about him and how these processes that he was doing actually worked. And again, we have those stamps. We have, this is, we have Queen Victoria's purple crown. It's really hard to see in this portrait here. But here's Queen Victoria up here you can see in her purple dress. So that is Perkins Perfect Purple. So just a quick review before we go. We've read this one. We've read Honeybee and we have read Your Place in the Universe. And after spring break we will read one more book and then we will have a vote 
where we will decide, well, each of you will be able to vote for your choice for the Cook Prize. And we'll see what our class votes for, what your school votes for, and then beyond that, what um, the Cook Prize winner is from schools from all over the world. So looking forward to it. Um, anybody have anything else, questions, comments before we go to uh, spring break for, for library? Have a great one, you guys. I will see you after break. Bye. Bye.